USA um, in, in some weird way. Um, this is a part of the material that, um, uh, thanks to Edward Snowden, uh, came to light. So um, it is not known if it's just a certain department of the NSA or like a summer intern who wrote some slides or if it's like the f it represents the full state of knowledge by the NSA about Tor. Um, so uh, in, in, in this presentation that was shown, um, they, they, they said that we will never be able to de-anonymize all Tor users uh, all the time. Um, but that they can, with manual analysis, de-anonymize a small fraction of Tor users. And I will come back to that later when we look at uh, some of the problems with the technology, some of the issues, and maybe how to address them, um, and, and, and what, what is likely the way uh, they're de-anonymizing currently. Um, this is a separate um, set of, um, of slides that was also released. Um, and this is, uh, this is a kind of a nice testimonial to say uh, that Tor is the king of high, secure, low latency internet anonymity and there are no contenders for the phone in waiting. Um, this sort of reflects also my thinking when people say, oh, I have heard Tor has this and that flaw and these and that problems, is that that might be the truth, but there's no alternative to it um, uh, when, it when it comes to anonymity online. Um, at least for now. Um, so, uh, first of all, one of the um, biggest problems that I have when, when, when I talk to journalists or even ordinary people, they misunderstand the term anonymous communication in the context of Tor. Um, anonymous communication is not about communication where you are trying to be anonymous. That's what I, what I called in this slide anonymous speech. Uh, so it's not about some like chat roulette kind of thing where you meet a random anonymous stranger. Because even anonymous is a very hard word. If you're talking to someone online and you meet them regularly and you don't know their name, you don't know much about their identity, you usually have a persistent identifier of that person. And that's pseudonymous. So I, I guess there's very little uh, uh, interest in, in communication that is really anonymous in that sense that you're talking, that you don't have any persistent identifier for the person you're talking to. Um, but even then, Tor isn't really about that. Um, so Tor is about two people who want to communicate. Um, in this slide it's A and B, very wonderful visualizations, I made it myself. Um, <laughs> And, and these people, they, they know each other, or it's a website that you know, and you're willing to, uh, to identify to that website. It doesn't matter. So uh, one, one, one uh, example would be, you want to access your Facebook, and Facebook, you, you're with your real name on Facebook, and you have all your friends uh, on Facebook, and, and you still want to reach uh, that website anonymously. Uh, so Tor is about protecting the link the communication path between communication partners. It's about um, making sure that from the outside it's very hard to see who is communicating with whom and when they're communicating. So in the, in the first talk today, um, uh, Ben talked about uh, post-quantum crypto and, and how, how, you, how we can uh, secure a communication link. Uh, but still, by, uh, by just by being able to see traffic flowing between communication partners. And we had a lot of uh, news about that, with like metadata correlation and analysis, network analysis of people that, I mean, you can, you can, you can uh, probably imagine that there's a lot of stuff you can derive just from knowing who is talking to whom, for how long they're talking, uh, when they're talking, etc., etc. And, and that isn't um, addressed by, by, um, by any cryptography. Um, that is what Tor is about. Tor is about additionally to securing the communication by end-to-end -end encryption. You also want to make sure that nobody sees the connection in the first place between communication partners. Um, I like this slide because, um, well, it's about human rights and I like human rights. Um, <laughs> And, and I, 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 I especially like the wording, and um, I want to 
always when, especially when I talk to journalists and they confront me with the negative effects of securing communication, making sure that nobody else can can sort of monitor who you're communicating with, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that it's clearly stated here that um, a human right is to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. And this, I think, is the main thing that TOR is about. And, and I, I want to include, so usually I, I include Article 20, uh, because I believe in, 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 in the, the, that when you're meeting online and communicating online, it's really about the right of assembly and association. Um, so I think that's also a very important human right, that we, we don't have to give up when we enter the digital world. Um, so, um, just as a reminder for most of you, I guess most of you have heard about TOR and like the generic concept of it. Uh, some of you may not. So, uh, the idea is that you have, nowadays you would call it the cloud. So, this is a TOR cloud. This is a, it's a, it's a, it's a network of, of TOR nodes, uh, as they're called in this slide, um, that provide uh, infrastructure that any Tor user can use to reroute their communications across the internet. So it's an overlay network over the internet. And the Tor client, the Tor user, connects to one of this, one of this sets of, of Tor relays, um, which is called the entry node, and then uh, makes, a set, uh, makes another connection to the middle node and then to the exit node. And the exit node is actually executing the request and forwards the answer um, back to the back to the user. Um, um, as you can see, it's, uh, you cannot see it very clearly here, but obviously there's encryption between these, and there's a not very good visualizations. That was one of the earliest visualizations of the concept behind Tor, which is called onion routing, uh, which is that you as a client. You know, you know public keys of all the participating relays. So you can, you can set up what they earlier, earlier called telescope, a telescope to the exit relay. So you encrypt the traffic that you want to send the data um, with, with what, is, what is colored blue here, uh, and only the exit relay can decrypt it. And then you encrypt it again with a key from the middle relay. And then you encrypt it again for the entry relay. So if you take the telescope and, and uh, turn it 90 degrees, you can see it's, it's like shells around the, the real traffic. So this is what, what, what is onion is about. It's, it's, like, onion, um, on, uh, it's like an onion uh, around your traffic. And, and that makes it possible. So on the entry node, you receive a connection from someone. And you, s you know who you're talking to. So you see the IP address of a user but you don't know the content of, um, of the data, and you don't see the destination address, and you don't see the exit address. All you see is when you remove your encryption layer at the entry relay, you see um, the address of the middle relay and the traffic you're going to hand to the middle relay. Um, so then you pass the traffic to the middle relay, and they remove their layer of encryption and then pass it on to the exit relay. And then the exit relay, um, so the middle relay sees only encrypted content, right? They see a connection coming from some relay. Um, they see that they have to forward it to another relay, but it's all encrypted with the, with the, with the exit relay key. Um, so they can't really see, they, they don't see the user side and they don't, don't see the destination or the content. And the exit relay, um, they see the initial request because that's what you want the exit relay to see because they will execute it on your behalf um, and make the request or send your data uh, to some destination and get the return um, content. And I will come back to that because, because that's, I mean, that's one of the things that people always confront um, uh, front, uh, Tor people with is that uh, the exit relay can see the original content that the user uh, was sent. Um, to the practical part, um, what you have to do when you want to use Tor is you, um, 
you just fire up the Tor browser bundle. You can download it from the website. This is a nice Windows screenshot. Um, it works cross-platform, so there's a, there's a Linux build, there's a, um, a Windows build, and a Mac build, and you can build it on your own obscure platform if you want to. Um, hmm? uh, there's, there's a version for Android. The, um, it's called Orbot. Um, and yes. Um, so what happens when you fire up the Tor browser? It's a modified Firefox because uh, today one of the problems that you have on top of um, hiding the communication path is that usually your applications that you want to use they also embed a lot of or make it possible to access a lot of information from your local platform that you don't want to leak. For example, the screen size or uh, all sorts of fingerprinting. Uh, there's a nice website called PanopticClick from the EFF where, you can, where, where they show you what kind of attributes they can get from your local machine via JavaScript and some other methods um, to, to fingerprint your machine. So even across sessions, um, no matter where you're coming from, um, they can, they can uh, re-identify you, so track you across sessions. Um, so at one point, uh, Tor decided that they, because one of the main applications of Tor is obviously web browsing, they had to provide even more application level support um, to protect against these tracking methods. Um, so at the beginning, um, we, we uh, tried to do it via, via an extension, so you would just install the Tor button extension in your browser and then switch to the Tor mode. Um, it, it turned out that there's a lot of fingerprinting methods that you can't really access as an extension that you would have to would want to disable. Um, so we're actively working with Mozilla to push all the changes we made into some kind of interface so we can enable it. Uh, there's even the process of, of integrating Tor completely in Firefox. Uh, they were very interested in, in, in having like a better private mode because the current private mode doesn't really protect what the user expects to protect. Um, so the current state is that it's not exactly a fork, it's a set of patches that are applied to the Firefox code base. And we're using the extended uh, service release, so we're not using whatever <coughs> new version Firefox spits out or Mozilla spits out every week. Um, but they have an extended service release meant for um, large companies that have to redeploy and, and they're depending on, on st more stable code base. So they do backport the security fixes, but they don't come with the latest features that nobody really needs anyway. And, and then we apply, I think at the moment it's around 40 patches to the code base. Uh, to further protect users from fingerprinting attacks. Um, and this is how it looks like. You can enter your destination address and use it as an ordinary browser. Um, the, the second approach, or the second um, most popular use of Tor is to use Tails. Uh, Tails is a live distribution based on Debian and it it comes pre-configured, so any application that comes with it, it routes its traffic through Tor, and you can't start anything and make uh, uh, connections like without Tor from your machine. <coughs> so it protects from from all sorts of attacks uh, uh, against against like you running something that de-anonymizes you because it runs on your local machine and it doesn't use Tor and makes an outgoing connection to something. Um, and also by being a live distribution, uh, you can put it on a read-only uh, medium, and then uh, an attacker cannot modify your your local your local system. And obviously, it's, again, since it's a, a live distribution, um, it doesn't leave traces on your machine. So you just boot it, you do whatever, and 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 it doesn't uh, affect any of your disks or whatever you have in your machine. Um, there's a lot of uh, interesting material that I want to show you, um, but I thought I would start with a number of users from Serbia. Um, there's a website called Metrics that has a lot of interesting statistics on both the network side and the user side. And um, 
as you can see, the number of connections coming from Serbia um, is pretty stable, uh, has been pretty stable over the last months. I didn't go back in time because there were some uh, incidents affecting the, the uh, calculation, the estimation uh, of, of users, but um, this is what we have at the moment. Um, um, I, in the, in the, even even um, when I arrived in, 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 in in the course of today, um, there was uh, like uh, even like frequently asked questions. People coming up and asking um, mostly the same questions about tour. Um, so I, I I thought I would uh, address these these uh, comments. Um, so one of the things people always repeat is, since you're making connections via relays and anyone can spin up a relay and basically forward traffic for other people. What happens if, if I'm a malicious actor and I run relays? Um, so there's, um, remember that there is uh, like uh, your, your entry relay into the network and a middle relay and an exit relay. So we have to look at all three positions for uh, the, the problems with malicious relays. And so a malicious exit relay, um, I already mentioned that a malicious exit relay uh, can see the user traffic and the destination address, but not the source uh, IP. And it can modify, obviously it can modify all the content that it sees. It can modify the, the, the request you're sending and it can modify the, um, the answer coming back. Um, the most important things uh, are DNS requests. Uh, DNS requests are UDP and Tor doesn't handle UDP. But for DNS, there's a subset of DNS requests, the com most common DNS requests, that Tor forwards to the exit, and the exit is supposed to, to execute the DNS requests and forward the answer back. Um, so um, it, it can modify the DNS um, answers. Um, it can look at HTTP traffic, modify the answer. Um, I can look at uh, SMTP, IMAP, the usual mail protocols, and all the other unencrypted protocols. Um, there were some studies where people ran it and monitored it and, and looked at the data that was flowing through. And I think still, um, I, I don't know about any recent uh, studies like that because um, it's, it's problematic if you, if you look at uh, traffic forwarded from other people. You, you usually lose your legal protection um, because you're not supposed to look at uh, user traffic. Um, and also ethically, um, it's, it's um, dangerous to, to do too, ma too many statistics and to look into packets from, from other people. But um, I, I, would, I would guess that there's still a lot of uh, plain text traffic on the Tor network. So this is a real problem. And uh, the, there, there is no good way for Tor to address this because it's the, the, it's the user's responsibility um, to decide what kind of applications they want to tunnel over Tor. Um, Tails used to tunnel everything you run on the Tails operating system via Tor. Um, they stopped doing that, so now uh, when you fire up any random application on, on Tails, it just fails. Um, because, uh, because you really want to have sort of control over what kind of applications um, can, even, can even use Tor in the first place. Um, this is why, why um, the Tor browser comes with an extension uh, like HTTPS everywhere. Uh, to make sure that, uh, at least for the websites that are known to support HTTPS, um, you're making HTTPS encrypted end-to-end -end encrypt uh, uh, connections. Um, um, I like uh, Certificate Patrol. Uh, it's an application that um, monitors the certificates over time. So when you see a certificate change in a website, it displays the change. So when certificates expire uh, at some point, so it allows changes that are near to the expiration date and only displays a small information window, uh, like a bar on top of the, of the browser. But if there's changes in the certificate authority or changes that uh, don't match with the expiration date, uh, you get a pop-up that shows the changes in the certificates. And that's very helpful um, because even with encrypted connections, 
if, if the exit relay is trying to actively um, play or mess with your, with your data, um, you, can, you can still hopefully detect that. And I mean, that's a big problem uh, for the whole internet that uh, HTTPS is basically um, known to have its big problems with the whole certificate authority um, um, issues. And we also run um, scanners across the network. Um, so they run all the time, constantly, looking at, at to applying certain tests. So you can't, obviously you can't detect someone who is sniffing the traffic, but you, you're able to, to um, hopefully find um, relays that modify. And it turns out that most of the relays that mess with user traffic that we found um, were, for example, were configured to use OpenDNS, and OpenDNS has a filter list, and they don't allow certain destinations. So that's one problem. And um, a lot of times it turns out to be a misconfigured system, and then you write to the relay operator, and you tell them about the problem, and they fix it. Um, there's a set of relays that pop up from time to time that are uh, trying um, like primitive man in the middle attacks that even the Tor browser without certificate patrol uh, will show you because they use self-signed certificates. Um, but I mean most users will, will likely just click and, and say continue. So it is a big issue. Um, then when you have a relay at the, at the entry position or at the middle position, uh, as you've seen, it only sees encrypted content. So the only thing that it could do is denial of service, basically, because they can just stop and, and, and not forward the traffic. Um, but if they forward the traffic, um, then, then there is not much they, they can do as a malicious uh, relay. Um, The, the, the bigger problem and what people hear from time to time with, with Tor, the issue with Tor and anonymization of users uh, is a big research question basically. Um, the, the, the question is how can you have a low latency anonymity network where you expect an answer to be, to be given back to you um, in, in, in a reasonable amount of time. You want to be browsing the web, for example. So you expect it to return the, the, the website um, in, a, in a reasonable time uh, span. So the, the current way the Tor network works is that the relay receives the traffic and it either has a connection to the next relay or it opens a connection to the, to the next relay immediately. Um, and then it forwards the traffic. And then you keep using that path uh, in, your, in your client for the, the default is for 10 minutes uh, if, the, if the exit relay allows your destination connection. So as an exit relay, I can specify what kind of destinations I allow uh, based on IP addresses or, um, and or port, ports. So I can, I can block certain ports, I can only <coughs> allow certain ports. Um, um, so we have a circuit uh, to an exit relay and it's, it's stable across the network. So the entry relay has a connection to the middle relay, the middle relay uh, to the exit. And now you're sending data across the Tor network and you're receiving an answer back. Um, so when I have a view of the network where I can see the traffic both entering to an entry, entry relay and exiting at some point, um, I, can, I can do a statistical analysis just by seeing, there's, there's various studies where they use various um, amounts of knowledge. Um, for example, if you just have the packet sizes, um, that's, that's already enough to de-anonymize users. Um, so an attacker that has a view over a certain set of Tor relays uh, can do that statistical analysis just because Tor can't really delay um, the packets because you expect from a low latency network that you get an answer back um, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so, if you're interested, there's a there's a, a, a quite old blog post on the Tor Project website, and this is a quote from a very recent study that's been made uh, about traffic correlation, and uh, it's quite scary. 
Um, so let me just read the, the highlighted uh, section. Um, uh, an adversary that provides no more bandwidth than some volunteers of today can de-anonymize any given users within three months of regulatory use with over 50% probability and within six months with over 80% probability. Um, so this study looked at various actors owning or having control or being able to monitor uh, certain fractions of the internet. Um, so uh, attackers that own one AS or two ASs or an internet exchange point um, or even uh, a larger fractions of the network. So this is a very interesting paper and I didn't put the address of the direct paper because I wanted to also um, tell you about AnonBIP. Um, it's a very good and large library of papers around anonymization. Um, so if you're interested in that topic, you should look at that website. And it has highlighted papers, uh, like the most relevant papers in the field. Um, so coming back to both problems of malicious relays and uh, traffic correlation attacks. Uh, these are problems of any uh, low latency network that you could imagine to ever exist, right? Um, because if, if your goal is to being able to connect to ordinary destinations that don't speak a new wonderful protocol, uh, then you will have someone, you will want to have someone on a network execute your request on your behalf. So in, in some sense, it's outside of the scope of Tor. Um, but as you can see with the Tor browser, we're starting to address these sort of application level problems and with HTTPS everywhere and things like that. Um, but um, I mean, we're all hoping for end-to-end uh, -end, um, encrypted traffic to increase. And <coughs> so hopefully malicious relays won't affect um, the, the, the usage of Tor that much in the future. And it's really, it's, it, sounds, it now sounds like Tor, like every time you use it, you hit a malicious relay. That's not the case. So our scanners find one in like every two or three weeks. So it's not really that big of an issue. And the traffic uh, correlation attacks, as you can imagine, any kind of technology that just forwards user traffic and, and, and sends back um, the, the, the replies is affected by this problem. Um, the naive solution would be to send tra constant traffic, right? So you, you don't disclose when you're executing requests or how much data you get back. But then you, your tunnel has to saturate the line um, at all time or limit, limit the, the dummy traffic and then you can't really use all, all your traffic. So dummy traffic can help in, in certain applications but to deploy it on the whole Tor network it would, would just generate too much traffic because the user would expect some kind of fraction of his bandwidth to be available for, for requests. Um, and at the same time, the Tor relays um, have to receive all that dummy traffic constantly from all the users. And with around 1.5 or up to 2 million users daily, um, you can imagine that uh, the, the current network wouldn't be able to handle that, that traffic. And then um, there's a lot of interesting studies that looked at this, and, and it's not even the, the, it's, it's dummy, generating dummy traffic and making sure that um, like the line is filled is, is not, not a trivial problem. Um, another thing that you hear regularly is that some entity, um, some government entity or whatever, runs uh, like a large fraction or some fraction of the network and that this is the reason why people are not using it. Um, there's variants of this, um, uh, this statement. Um, and for, for, for the, the, the question is what would they gain by running relays? And for a traffic correlation attack, that's a passive attack. As long as I can see the traffic flowing into that relay and, and the traffic exiting that relay, uh, I don't really need to run any part of the infrastructure. Um, and then the other thing is a personal thing. Um, I'm, I'm, 
me and, and many other people at Tor, um, they, they build relationships with relay operators. They know a lot of relay operators and we keep a close watch on who is running what fraction of the network, who is behind that, who is the guy behind that. Um, and then the third thing I, I usually say is it would actually be nice because then we wouldn't rely on people like me to, to run uh, relays. It would be nice to have competing agencies um, run relays for us because even if you, if you run um, uh, like a fraction of the relays, there's still the traffic correlation attack, but um, you can do that without running relays. Um, but um, if, you, if, you, if you just run like the, the, the entry relay for that connection, then you don't really gain anything other than providing free bandwidth to all Tor users. And if you run an exit relay, um, you, you also strengthen the network for all Tor users. Because even when you run an exit relay, all you can see is, is the destination and the content. You can't see the, the user IP address. Um, so coming back to, to that this is a general problem, um, I always ask, uh, what, what do you trust? And then a lot of people say, yeah, I have this VPN provider. Uh, that I trust and even some people they know the people that run the VPN provider, but in the end um, The VPN provider is it can be can be much more dangerous than a Tor relay uh, Because they see both the user connection and they see the content and the so, so both problems uh, Apply very hard also to to VPN or any any proxy um, And if you're worried about the traffic correlation attack obviously a VPN uh, is not going to help you and as we, we, we've seen from some NSA slides, they kind of seem to have some more or less automated way of, of de-anonymizing VPNs and proxies. Um, I don't know too much about it, the slides didn't really say, but um, some slides hinted towards that uh, capability. So let's look at the Tor network, because on the one side Tor is a software, uh, it's even more than one software. It's the Tor browser, it's the Tor client and relay program, and then there's a lot of other tools. And on the other hand, uh, there's the network. And when you, when you see like, this picture of, of stable relays running, you would say this is a quite healthy network. Uh, looks okay, there's some centralization, but it's quite distributed. Um, but um, then if you, if you look deeper into it, and if you look at the fast, if you, if you remove all the slow, very slow relays that are not really helping much to the network, um, then you end up, at some point, you end up looking at this map. And this is exit relays that pump more than one megabyte uh, per second. So these attract the majority of the users. Um, and then, then you see it's yeah it's it's not a very happy network. Um, so that and that's that's mostly my area of 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 interest and where I'm active is trying to teach people about how to set up relays and run relays, strengthen the network, help other Tor people, uh, both in like how to actually run a relay, and also in. Um, and, and trying to make people aware of it, obviously. And um, so, what I started. Um, uh, let's yeah, let's let's look at some other tools that are interesting, because um, as I said, I'm 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 advocating for people to learn more about Tor, and people always come and say, how can I help? And in the case of a non-technical person and they don't know how to run a relay or they don't want to uh, really do it, um, there's, there's also other ways to just explore the network and learn about it. And what we, at this point, can use also for, for advocacy and, and journalists would, for example, be visualizations of the data. So that's why I, I want to present the current state of the, both the data and some of the visualizations we have. Um, so you can learn um, from the data, but you can also learn that our visualizations can, can be vastly improved. And um, so if you're interested in, in programming, this would be one area 
where you could uh, just um, look at visualization um, methods and, and take our data, it's all publicly available, and, and play around with it. Um, Compass is a less known uh, tool in the Tor community, that's why I have it here. Um, it allows you to filter all the Tor relays in the network and only look at uh, certain um, relays. But uh, the interesting thing is the, the group relays by country and the group relays by S. And then you can look at the distribution of Tor relays based on the fraction of, of traffic that a certain country provides for the Tor network. Um, and, and enter like Serbia and look at all the relays in Serbia. Um, and this is, this is uh, the, the answer to a request that asks to, summar to, to sum up all the countries and then show each country and the total probability. Um, so there's, there's some columns here and, and I mark the exit probability. So this is the probability of a client to exit in that country, right? And uh, as you can see, um, it's not very evenly distributed across countries. Um, most of the traffic at, at the point of the screenshot, 30% um, like of it exited in the US, and then there's 11% Sweden, 11% in the Netherlands. Um, so, and this is just the top, um, the top seven <coughs> in this screenshot. So as you can imagine, one of the things we're looking into is how can we, how, how can we attract uh, relay operators in other countries? How can we find ISPs in other countries? Um, and uh, the same for the guard probability. I didn't talk about guards much, but you can, you can roughly say that's the entry probability. So when you, when you fire up your client in 27% of the cases that you're using it, it will connect again uh, to some relay in the US. Um, and in 22% of the cases, you will end up in Germany. And when we go back to the, to the major known attack against Tor, that an adversary that can see the traffic uh, at the entry point level and at the exit point level can de-anonymize users, you can imagine that uh, the strengthening the network is really important because, because obviously, if you're very evenly distributed, uh, an attacker has to be very powerful to see the, this traffic. And this is not the case, as you can see from the slides. Um, this is a screenshot of the metrics website. I want to show it, um, hopefully, if my connection is still up live. Um, I mentioned this before. Um, so here you can look at the state of the network. It's, I won't go into detail, but you can, you can click around yourself. Um, the bandwidth um, and, um, and there's, there's a nice um, bubble graph about um, um, the distribution of relays per country. I don't know if it loads here. Yes, it does. So, as you can see, this is Germany. It's just another representation of the data that I showed you in, in text format. Netherlands, France, United States. And, yeah, that's not very evenly distributed. And the, the, the major reason I'm showing you this in a bit more detail is that um, metrics and compass all use the data provided by uh, Onion U. Onion U is fairly new, and it's an abstraction away from, from just using the raw data that Tor uses to generate some visualizations. So it sits between the raw data um, and, and the visualization, the metrics and compass. And it's a, it's, a, it's a simple JSON API you can query. And it has a lot of stuff uh, that you can simply query. Um, I can show you one. So yeah, now that I'm using live internet, it's always a danger. But you can see that, for example, for the relays, you can you can get an array of the flags that are assigned to the relay, the country, a country name, region name, city name, if it's available, um, the AS number. 
so the network it is located in. And, um, so there's a lot of interesting data available, and that's why I want to show this, because people are really aware of this. They only look at the outcome, um, like Tor metrics, and rarely at the, at the back end. So when you're, if you're capable of uh, like programming against the JSON interface, you can, you can just look for interesting data and analyze it. Um, there's a, this is a, from the blog, so uh, it's a call for, for front-end web developers for Atlas and Globe. Um, Atlas and Globe, I can show you, are, let's, do, let's use Compass, for example, to look at, at Serbia. And I, I, I won't select any of the other options, so I'm, I'm selecting all relays here. Um, I'm not grouping them, so I want to see all the relays here. And this is the state of the network in Serbia. Um, um, so now probably you can imagine uh, why Milobit, uh, Milos is, is strongly trying to uh, find more people in Serbia to run relays. Um, there's not much bandwidth uh, in, uh, here. There's, there's, on this current network, there is no exit. Uh, in Serbia. Um, that's the current state of the network. This? So, yeah, that's what I want to show you. This is... Um, I just need to clarify. Serbia has no exit. Okay, so this is Atlas. This is one of the applications that uh, we're looking for people to work on. Uh, Globe is very similar. It uh, displays uh, information, uh, def uh, more detailed information about single relays. So you see the exit policy. And as you can see here, this relay, this relay allows exiting on certain ports, uh, like 25, 1110. So this is plain text traffic. This is encrypted traffic. This is HTTPS. Um, but Tor doesn't qualify, it doesn't, it, uh, this relay doesn't qualify as being called an exit because the exit status in the network is tied uh, to certain ports that you have to allow. And one of the ports is port 80. Um, and uh, if you don't have the exit flag, the clients will, are very unlikely to use you for any exiting. Uh, so in some sense, both uh, are, are true. There are some exits and there are no exits because, because they're not really uh, very helpful unless they get the exit flag. Uh, I've been running that node for maybe one and a half year. And uh, I've, uh, in the meantime, I've reinstalled it and I forgot to back up the keys, so there's not whole history. Yeah, yeah. But uh, when uh, I enabled port 80, uh, because it's Raspberry Pi computer, I guess the crypto is too hard for that and it starts to drop packets. So yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, but what by disabling port 80, I mean 80 is just uh, just uh, HTTP traffic. But yeah. by that, you remove the exit flag so you don't get the traffic, and obviously, then a Raspberry Pi is strong enough to, yeah. to be, be a relay. Um, Should I but, just disable yeah. like just to be middle, middle no, it's fine like that. You can leave it like that. Um, it's just the Raspberry Pi is not really suitable to, to contribute much. Um, it's nice. It's a nice experiment and uh, a nice little box. Um, so um, all this data is available from Onion U, from the jQuery, uh, the JSON interface, and um, Globe. Globe is very similar if it loads. <laughs> um, doesn't like me. Um, anyway, so uh, if you're interested in, in helping and visualization of data, um, this is what you want to look at. Um, there's another recent um, call to arms it's about a fellowship program that is available at the moment. So you can apply for, 
for um, working on a specific aspect of the problem of a problem we we're having, uh, namely the problem that a lot of websites start using third-party um, block lists um, or services like Cloudflare. And these these services they just take any IP address and they, when they see it, uh, abuse coming from that IP address, they block that IP address. So a lot of exit relays are blocked from certain websites. Um, and there's interesting research, there's a lot of proposals on how to help operators of websites um, avoid having to block Tor uh, users completely. Um, so this is a very recent, uh, August 29 was released. It doesn't load for me. It doesn't matter, it looks, I can... It should take the, the, the same query strings. I wanted to show the difference. I can take this. So this is Globe before we saw Atlas, but the, it's mostly, it's, it's basically the same. It shows the information about the relay um, and the exit policy and the flags it has. And uh, yes. Um, so this might be very interesting for someone who understands enough about technology, but it's, it's less a technology problem. It's more about providing the right information. Or maybe, for example, one could imagine that uh, for, for uh, popular content management systems that we, we would develop plugins that help you categorize your users and say, OK, a Tor user, uh, all comments coming from Tor users are going into moderation. Because that will help against people trying to fill your blog with stupid comments or stuff like that. So um, it's not an all or nothing decision. Usually you can, you, can, you can classify your users into certain like, danger groups. And that's also interesting outside of, of Tor, because um, just using the IP address and blocking all users from that IP address, uh, obviously you can imagine that uh, this is a larger problem than just, just for Tor. Um, so in general, the blog is a very interesting website to have in mind and, and, and to stay up to date. Um, you might want to subscribe to that. Here I have opened the, the Anon BIP, the Selected Papers and Anonymity that I mentioned earlier. Um, so it goes back to 1977 and it has a lot of papers. So if you have some free time, like just dedicated it to, to, to this website and then you will know everything. And as you can see, there's some highlighted papers here um, that you might want to look into. Um, okay. So I already mentioned that uh, my, my, my focus at Tor is to look at uh, the network and try to help diversify and, and strengthen the network, both by providing more bandwidth so it gets faster and by providing more diverse uh, network so it, gets, uh, it strengthens the anonymity. Um, so this is, this is a project I started, it's called torservers.net and it's all about operating relays. And in 2010, I started doing this, and I, I started a call for like, let's, let's, let, let, let's run an exit relay together. So if you want to chip in and, and give me some money, uh, I will run a large relay. And after half a year, I had like um, almost 80% of the exit capability of the whole network. Uh, that wasn't a good thing because one person shouldn't be responsible for, for a large fraction of the network. And back in 2010 it wasn't as popular as now, so we, we managed to also find more and more people. I started to call it like franchising um, uh, because I was speaking at a lot of conferences and with a lot of people. So um, now we're 13 organizations because you also want to have legal and operational diversity. You don't want me to be able to, to access all these relays. Um, and uh, Benfix was very helpful, the, the Holland Foundation was very helpful. Um, and now we got a grant from HEVOS, it's a Dutch foundation, um, to, to further strengthen the network. Um, and this is um, like a summary of 
whatever um, interesting things that I, I could imagine would be interesting for you, there's a very good email newsletter. It's called the Tor Weekly News that you can just subscribe to um, or you, you subscribe to the RSS feed um, that will help you keep up to date, learn new things about Tor just by reading an email every week. It's very good. Um, then the Anonbiv, I mentioned the blog altogether. The blog has the Tor Weekly News and more. So if the Tor Weekly News is too little information for you, subscribe to the whole blog. And then the real way to get involved in Tor is to be in IRC. Uh, everything is happening on IRC. And these are the, the major channels that we're using. So it's the Tor service channel for relay operation. It's the dev channel for code development. It's the, this is a fairly new Tor, Tor Dash project is a fairly new channel. Um, it's for, for everything around the project, the website, whatever, uh, except for, for coding parts. So this is a very interesting channel also if you just want to understand the community more, get to know the people, this is where you want to be. Um, and then there's Tor, it's, it's the, the regular the channel that is now mostly for, for like user interaction and user questions. And a very fun channel to be in sometimes is not Tor because there you are allowed to talk about everything. Um, but it's still, it's still somewhat close to Tor. So people post <coughs> random links, random cat images, um, whatever. Sometimes you can't read it for days because there's some, uh, yeah, some people on there you don't want to really waste your time on. But it can also be very interesting. So um, I invite everyone to, if you want to uh, stay in contact, to use IRC. Um, then there's all our mailing lists. Um, I guess you can find them and then um, at the end this is my email address and my fingerprint um, you can't really read it but um, as a reference some of you took pictures so um, yeah this is my talk thank you We had a question here. Uh, yeah. Could Tor user be tracked by another user? Random user. Well, Could Tor user be tracked by the random users? By what? By what abuse? Random user that's using, that not using Tor. Well, what do you mean by being tracked by? To find his real IP address and Um. So. What, what you see at a, let's say you're a website operator and you want to identify a user, all you see is the exit IP address. So there's no way to see the real IP address, that's the, that's the purpose. Um, and, um, and then you would have to go back the whole chain of, of, of the network to be able to find out who was, who was the user. Yeah. Me? Yes. You sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the lawyer, please. Yeah. Uh, when you showed uh, the graph of use, usage from Serbia, uh, you uh, censored the graph, see? saying before there were some kind of some. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quoting you. The mm -hmm. quote would be. Um, there were some incidents that uh, prevented yes. me from showing you this. I mean, it's all online. It's not. I'm not. I mean, censoring would be to um, to yeah, stop I you from that from I getting that information. To, to uh, get yes. The yes. Not uh, users. We want user is, graph. Uh, the point is, uh, could you uh, give us the correlation and in, in between? Uh, yeah. So this is directly all connecting all users in all countries. So this is is not only affecting Serbia. Um, this was a botnet jumping on Tor. So it used Tor as a backup plan for communicating with the command and control server. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't look like they actually used that backup channel to communicate with the botnet, um, but they added it. So they, they rolled out a Tor client to all botnet uh, clients, to all, all, 
all, all clients infected by the botnet. So every, every uh, computer that was part of the botnet started to run a Tor client. And Tor uh, makes, makes connections, even if you're not using it, preparing connections so um, it's faster if you start using it. And this is what you can see here. I was, I was more, uh, my question was more uh, directed to uh, certain political developments in Serbia and correlations in usage. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert about yeah. Serbia. You are. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, some of you are. So um, we're always interested in, in learning. But you can see the, the graph from Serbia is very much uh, very similar to the graph of overall users. So I can't really see that much of a spike. We can maybe look, we can zoom into detail uh, here, yes, but we can... The real users are always on the network. Before nobody was always using those are all bots. So that's a, a valid point is that we don't know how many bots are still out there. So Microsoft was leading an effort because it was all Windows. Microsoft was leading an effort to kill the whole botnet. And they released uh, a statement where they said they, they more or less killed the whole thing. But you're right, it doesn't, even from the overall users, it's very hard nowadays when people ask us how much users do you have on your network because we lost the ability thanks to that uh, stupid botnet. Uh, Microsoft came and uh, deleted the Trojan from Windows PCs, but they left the Tor exit. The Tor, the Tor client, they left it there. But it shouldn't be started. It shouldn't be started, it, uh, yes. but yeah. maybe they didn't repair the registry. Maybe it's starting every day because that is, they, they removed. They managed lots. to remove uh, a lot. So a lot. They yeah. removed a lot, but they didn't remove all. Yeah. Those, those are really not users. It is possible that the Tor user trains his packets through the Tor to, to the exit. Right. Yes, because you define what kind of traffic you send into the network, but you also know what path you're taking. So as a user, you know already the path you're taking. You don't, there's no necessity to, to really, you really trace anything because you build the path as a Tor user. And then you can inject traffic, obviously, and yes, you can sort of trace it, but you already know the exit relay. Uh, the servers uh, that access uh, only in the Tor network, with only a domain. Yeah. Uh, uh, traffic to the dead servers. Uh, that uh, that uh, traffic go to the exit node and then ba back to the Tor, or how encryption go? I didn't talk at all about um, .onion or the hidden services that Tor supports. So there was a research um, that had, there was the funny idea that you could also hide the destination by just uh, the Tor user makes this connection right to the to another server outside of the Tor network, but you can also use this backwards. And the the simple uh, approach to this would be to just use a a, a a rendezvous point, a point where you meet your users. So you. You can imagine, like, like you, you can think of a, of a hidden service as the same uh, uh, like a user, but it keeps asking some, some point in the network for, for users, and then they connect. So you have a user protected by three hops, and you have a hidden service that more or less also uses three hops, and they meet in the middle. That's a very rough, and, and, and it's a lie, it's not the real explanation, but that's, that's hidden services. So hidden services try to hide the destination address so you can run websites anonymously by using the same strategy and putting the server behind the three hops. And you have, you have in the middle, you, you have a point where you, where you meet and exchange information. I, it, I, it wasn't enough time to, to talk about this whole dark net thing that a lot of people are interested in. Um, you can configure it for more hops, um, but it's, it's very much discouraged 
And as a relay operator, uh, the, the, the new default is to reject this. Um, so the, the problem is that it puts additional load to the network and it doesn't really uh, provide any benefit in anonymity. Because the only real attack in this is if you're seeing the entry connection and the exit connection, you don't care about the middle. You can put in a lot of hops in the middle because you're just doing a statistical analysis at the entry point and the exit. So it doesn't really help anything other than uh, that it fills the Tor network with more traffic. Uh, I have uh, two uh, short questions. Uh, first, uh, uh, I like to watch daily show with John Stewart, but they canceled the show uh, in Europe, so we can't watch it online. So um, they want us to uh, have a different address, you know what I mean. Uh, and I'm wondering, can we use this network to, uh, uh, to disguise our location and to say, oh, we come from uh, USA? So the biggest problem is if people, like, you, you, you should have asked only your question and not why you want to do it. Because I'm not allowed to tell you how you can uh, infringe copyright or avoid. Uh, <laughs> so we have, le we have lawyers present. It's, um, Will you be so kind <laughs> and apply Article 19? <laughs> They're not uh, laws. What? <laughs> sorry, that's, that's over law. I, I'm sorry. Um, it's not copyright infringement. <laughs> if, you, if you say I'm not from here, I'm from there. Because it's the freedom it. of movement on Article 15. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he can. <laughs> <laughs>